Uh, hello, I'm Emily Mims. I'm here today in Bristol, Virginia at the Birthplace of Country Music Museum to talk a little bit about my new series, which we're going to call the Smoky Blue Series. It will be set here in Appalachia, uh, a, a part of the country that I have come to know well and love even more. I made my first trip to Appalachia in the summer of 2009. My son and his family had moved here. They needed grandma's help for a few weeks while mom and dad got established in their new jobs. And I came and I fell in love with the countryside, with the people, with everything about Appalachia. It's very different from my home in Texas. For one thing, it's green. These people get rain. It's green, the mountains, they're majestic, but at the same time, they're soft, they're calming, they're peaceful, they're hazy. I would sit at, and out in my son's sunroom and just look up at the mountains. It was incredible, absolutely incredibly beautiful. And at the same time, I fell in love with the people. Things are different here. They're a little slower. They're never in a hurry. Everybody is friendly. Everybody is kind. Everybody calls you honey. They don't know how to be fast or rude. And I just fell in love with them. They always have a smile on their face. Absolutely wonderful people. And at the same time, I fell in love with their music. Now, I've always been a musician. Grew up playing hymns in the Baptist church, uh, play keyboard, picked up a guitar in my high school years, listened to George Strait and Western Swing all my life. But when I came here, I discovered a new kind of music, or new to me, and it was the uh, mountain music, the bluegrass music of the Appalachians. And not being particularly big on research, but just liking the music, I started playing it. Found Sirius F SM, whatever, FM number 61, and started listening to the bluegrass music and fell in love with that too. It's a little different from country music, same, same roots. But I also started to fall in love with the mountain music, which is the music that actually preceded bluegrass music. This is the music of the, of the hill folks here, the country people, um, mountain people, so to speak. These, this was the music that their ancestors brought over 250 years ago, perhaps. Uh, and they've played in the hollows and up on the hills ever since. Today I have standing behind four instruments, all of which are used in a traditional bluegrass band. In fact, the only instrument that's not back here is a bass. The guitar, you know, we use that for just about everything. Um, the other three would be the mandolin, very sweet, very high, high sound, in the hands of a master. A mandolin is absolutely the most beautiful instrument you ever heard. Of course, everybody knows what a fiddle is. Um, incredible fiddling in this part of the country. Kids are brought up on the, on the fiddle. And the claw-hammered banjo, another instrument that in the right hands is absolute magic. Now, in my fictional world, set here in Bristol, or in the Tri-Cities area of Tennessee, I started with a band, a bluegrass band. Uh, and it, the Barstows, a family band, not big time Pete, or at least not yet. They may get a little bit bigger time as the books progress. But they make music because they love it. My current hero, heroine, Kylie Richards, plays mandolin in the band. She also plays the mountain dulcimer in the band, or in uh, sometimes with the band, sometimes not. Um, the music here comes from these people's souls. The music comes from their hearts, no matter how trained they might be or might not be. That's the whole essence of bluegrass music, is that it comes from within. And this is where the whole band, Kylie, her brother, Cooper, her cousin, Jake, and his wife, Timberland, their other cousin, Bradley, all perform in this band. And they say, all music comes from the heart. My hero, Reynolds Navarro, can understand this because he too is a musician. He comes from the mariachi world, however, of South Texas. And those of you who have read Once Again 
or a gift of hope have already met Wren. He is a musician, a quite wealthy man, who goes undercover as a favor to a friend to try to find out what's going on in the Barstow's club acoustics because something fishy is going on in that band, in that club and it involves drugs. Appalachia is just like the rest of us. They are not immune. It's beautiful and wonderful as this countryside is. They're not immune to the drug problem that everybody else experience, is experiencing. Nor are they immune in my, in my fictional world. Kylie and her family not only play bluegrass music, but they also play a, an array of old-timey traditional mountain instruments. I'm not going to talk about all of them today, but I want to introduce you to the first one, the one that Kylie plays, the mountain dulcimer. I brought mine in so that I could play it a little bit for you and show you what a mountain dulcimer sounds like. I fell in love with the dulcimer in 2012. I happened upon one a, a fellow selling them in Pigeon Forge. I'd never seen one before but he was over there making some cool music at his kiosk and I thought, well, I'll go take a look. And he showed me how to play. I have, back, with my background in music, it wasn't hard to pick it up and take it home to San Antonio, play around on it, learn to play a few numbers. Thought I was getting good. And then I found a tiny but thriving group of dulcimer players in San Antonio. Believe me, we're a minority in San Antonio. And found out just how little I knew and how poorly I really did play. But I still love the little instrument. It's wonderful for a lot of different things. It's wonderful for making, but in particular for making this wonderful mountain music these people make up here. Dulcimers are very common in this part of the country. A lot of people play them, a lot of young people play them, they're learning to play them. And so I thought, since Kylie is a dulcimer player, I would show you the instrument that Kylie plays. I own several dulcimers, this is my favorite. Dulcimers are normally made by specialty craftsmen, they are not commercially pr produced much. Uh, most dulcimers are made in tiny work, tiny craft shop somewhere, or perhaps even in someone's garage. They have to be strapped on. You have to sit to play one. I've never seen anybody play one standing up. They are a diatonic instrument in that to change key, you have to retune rather than just refinger. Traditionally, they're played in the key of D. I always play in the key of D. Four strings. This is the only instrument that was ever produced or developed in the United States. Every other instrument comes to us from another country. But this one was developed here in uh, the mountains. And again, I apologize in advance, I'm not real good at this, but i would play you a couple of numbers so you can get an idea of what they sound like and what they can be used for. The first would be a little bit of gospel music because the gospel music is absolutely part and parcel of the mountain music and the bluegrass music. A lot of this music was developed in churches as people here worship their Lord. Okay, another one I'd like to show you, very, very short, small clip of it would be how you would, something a bit more modern, but that takes well to the dulcimer. This would be John Denver's Country Road, and we're going to play a little bit of it.
And one more, just a little tiny brief chunk of it. Uh, when I went to buy this dulcimer, I said something to the uh, craftsman about not being able to play classical music on it. And he grinned at me, pulled the dulcimer back over, whipped it around so he was facing him, and showed me that you most certainly can. Now, I've admitted I'm not very good on this thing, but if you can imagine it in Kylie's hands, in the hands of a truly gifted musician, what could be done with the mountain dulcimer? Kylie's son, Danny, plays a hammered dulcimer. Now, I don't play the hammered dulcimer. It's a hard instrument to learn. It's basically a big triangular shape, about like this, that you play with hammers. It's an incredible instrument, again, in the hands of the right person. It's absolute magic. Now, in my next book, I will be demonstrating, or for my next book, for my next video, I'll be demonstrating the bowed psaltery, which is a stringed instrument. Again, not a common instrument. They're made by specialty luthiers. Amputee hero Cooper plays that because he can do it with one hand, with one arm. Now, a little bit more, perhaps, about Bristol, Tennessee, where I've set the book. Uh, Bristol sits right on the state line between Virginia and Tennessee. Downtown Bristol, one side of the street, you're in Tennessee. One side of the street, you're in Virginia. Uh, and this is where I've set the uh, club acoustics that's owned by Kylie and her brother Cooper. Bristol is a very picturesque town, very pretty. Um, and certainly a beautiful place to set a story. Although, as is typical of the folks in this area, Kylie and Cooper work in Bristol but live in Kingsport. Um, this third city would, of the Tri-Cities area would be Johnson City. And I, as the books progress, I will include all three, book, all three uh, towns as well as perhaps looking at the Crooked Road, which would be up in Virginia, that is a literally a road of musical venues, and the Blue Ridge Parkway in North Carolina, which is close to Asheville, which is also the music, uh, the series of musical venues there. Um, hopefully, as you read the books, you will come to understand the deep love that I have for the bluegrass music and that I hope I have shared my, that my characters have for, their, for this wonderful music. It's music, it can be technically perfect, it can be wonderful, but primarily it comes from the heart. And you can muff it and play it badly and hit some bad notes, and it still comes from the heart. Thank you. Hi, I'm standing in front of the famous Bristol, Virginia slash Tennessee state line sign that has been here, I want to say about a hundred years, uh, dis, uh, denoting State Street and the border between Brit Tennessee and Virginia. I'm standing on the Virginia side. If I were to go across the street, I would be in Tennessee. Bristol's a cool little town in that it's got two police forces, uh, two tax structures, two everythings, and that the line is drawn right down the middle of State Street. Bristol takes its reputation or its moniker as the birthplace of country music very, very seriously. There are murals and monuments all over the little town 
to the music industry, to their history. Bristol is considered the birthplace of country music because of the famous Bristol Sessions, which uh, occurred in 1920, uh, happened in 1927. Uh, the Victor Record Company from New York wanted to mine some of this wonderful music here, and rather than expect the rather poor musicians to come all the way to New York for taping, they came here. They brought the most modern equipment they had, and in a two, over a two week period, they scheduled dozens, dozens of talented musicians, nobodies mostly, who wanted to perform. Among them, the Carter family and Jimmy Rogers, both of, which, both of whom got their starts right here at the Bristol, uh, Bristol Sessions. Bristol has taken that more or less and run with it. They're known for their music. They have their famous Rhythm and Roots Festival every September, which, in which hundreds of bands come to perform. The sessions, as music does, developed, it, it grew from there, basically was the birth of our, country, our modern country and bluegrass music. Now, I envision my characters knowing all of this, but I don't go into it much in the books because frankly, they're like every other hometown kid, they take it all for granted. Hi, I'm on downtown State Street, which straddles the line between Virginia and Tennessee. I'm actually standing in Virginia right now, but if, you, if, you, if I crossed the street, I would be in Tennessee. Uncle Sam's over there is actually in Tennessee. Funky, maybe six, seven block area of old buildings, some of which have been beautifully restored, some of which are in the process of, um, with a number of antique stores, boutiques, restaurants, clubs, um, the occasional business bank or two. A fun place to spend the afternoon and the evening, which a lot of people do. It's a tourist draw, and yet the locals also enjoy it. This is the strip upon which I have located the fictional club that belongs to Kylie and Cooper, uh, their club Acoustics. Acoustics is a long-held dream of the Barstow family. For two generations, they have wanted to open a club in downtown Bristol, and they finally have their chance. But as the story begins, Kylie is about to lose everything because of the dishonesty and irresponsibility of her late husband. However, she becomes the recipient of the generosity of a mystery benefactor who has to remain secret, as does the source of, of his generosity, which lands her right in the sights of the DEA because with no explanation for that money and the suspicion that drugs are being dealt out of, of acoustics, she is the most likely suspect for being the dealer. At that point, our hero, Rin Navarro, is inserted by the DEA undercover in the persona of Reynolds Campbell, which isn't too far from the truth because our hero, although he grew up in Texas, his mother is from Kentucky and he is well, very familiar with the music, the culture, and the values and customs of this area which means that he can pull off the perfect sub subterfuge. Kylie does not know she is being lied to. Kylie already has trust issues because of the uh, dishonesty, perfidy of her late husband, and she is not the woman to forgive a liar when she finds out she has been lied to. That being the crux of the story, nevertheless, the story is very much from this area, from this region, uh, with the ambiance and atmosphere of the Appalachians.